Thank you so very much. The first thing I'm going to do is put my timer on because my goodness, I could keep talking forever. <laughs> so thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, it's exciting to see so many people logging in from all around the globe, uh, from Glasgow to Dubai to Singapore. Uh, welcome to our learning lab. I call it our Imaginarium, uh, where, we, uh, where we hope to um, move forward into, uh, dare I say, next generation thinking about learning spaces. Just for those of you who don't know us at Hong Kong U, here is a little quick uh, from our quick stats at the university. We are an English medium research led and large comprehensive university. So uh, that means we're trying to do everything from basic sciences, engineering through to uh, liberal arts, um, philosophy, and of course, education. Uh, we uh, have an increasing footprint, and so not perhaps as large as Harriet Watts, <laughs> but we, um, we have increasingly moving across the Greater Bay Area um, as, we, uh, as we connect more and more with um, mainland China and this, particularly this area around us. 10 faculties, 32,000 students. You'll notice that the majority of our students are government funded. And so we are well um, supported by the Hong Kong government. Our undergrad students are actually a very coherent group in many ways. When you talk to other institutions, they'll have a lot of mature age students, people doing second degrees, returning to university and changing degrees. We have a majority are coming from our local secondary school system into Hong Kong U. So they um, are generally still in their teens and uh, many of them actually live on campus. About one third um, live on campus. Staff profile, about 52% of our 8,800 staff are professoriate. It's fantastic to be continuing the conversation. Um, we've actually uh, had early conversations. There's Martha sitting there helping us out when we were all struggling during the pandemic. And um, my colleague, Professor Cecilia Chan, ran this Education 4.0 series as we were all struggling to think about what was going to happen during um, cl campus closures. And we really appreciated that initial interaction with Harriet Watt. And I particularly um, was delighted to be able to um, have a keynote with you back in uh, later in 2020. So our unit, like um, many units around the globe, have been ramping up activity in order initially to help us get through the online, as many used to call it, pivot the emergency remote teaching phase. Now, um, some institutions were open institutions able to handle all of this without any great trauma. For us, of course, as an on-campus experience, this uh, was a major challenge. And so we worked through this um, very much with a bottom-up approach. We had, um, in those challenging years, we'd had campus closures already before everybody else because we had a social movement. And um, so there was a little bit of a moment where we started before you. Uh, and then of course, from January, 2020, we went online, took a bottom up approach, created the, the um, sandboxes for online course designing, et cetera. Uh, and then we tried to come back in 2020. And that itchy, we talked in the last keynote about wicked problems. Well, the wicked problem of what A, what we called it, and B, how we experienced it, was this notion of dual mode, hybrid. Many North Americans are talking about high flex. Just finding the language around what we were attempting was already quite challenging. And so uh, we tried this tried this idea where the faculty were asked to come to campus and the students could opt in or out. Uh, it lasted for three weeks and uh, our survey of colleagues was unanimously, this is really the most challenging thing I've ever tried as a teacher. The rooms don't work. The um, interactions with the students are very challenging. Please don't make me do it again. <laughs> so 21, we returned to campus. But then we were also in this period, given the opportunity by the University Grants Council to start rethinking, just also thinking about uptake. So we went from 2018, 19 in our ad hoc events, not our set programs that we have, our ad hoc seminars and um, uh, professional development events. We went from 
you know, one and a half thousand in 2018, 19 attendees right up to over 6,000 fully online by the time we went to 2020, 21. We know as a unit that colleagues are going to be continually wanting to join us in this kind of environment. They, um, as the campus footprint is more distributed, as colleagues are more used to the convenience of being able to be in their office and zoom in uh, for, a, for a seminar or event, just as we are now, we know that we're going to have to adapt to that. Let's go back to that topic we, we first raised about inquiry-based learning and how fundamentally I feel that as we, as one of our university aims is engaging our students in critical intellectual inquiry. And that remains where we want to be. And we've had a long history at Hong Kong U, um, particularly in our professional faculties, medicine, dentistry, speech and hearing, engineering, all working originally about 15 years ago, sorry, more than that, uh, with problem-based learning and then trying out all sorts of different approaches, but fundamentally driven by inquiry. So as uh, this is my 15th year at Hong Kong U and I get my long service award. So I'm very excited to get my free pen from the university and, <laughs> and have, attend the award ceremony in a couple of days. So I first arrived as an educator joining a faculty of dentistry. And so I was learning a lot. My background is ethnography. So I'm in there understanding from the ground. And I think that's such an important aspect of, it, of building an ethnographic eye, but bringing your expertise uh, and working with colleagues such as Professor Chu here. So co-constructing research, co-constructing curricula, and as you said, um, interdisciplinarity is key. So what are some of the challenges we already have said are introduced in 2020 that I think of PBL in terms of this framework as a philosophy, as a curriculum design, as a pedagogic approach. So as a philosophy, we've been challenged by these um, notions of fluid modernity. Brian Hodges um, gave us a talk to our medical faculty in 2017, and he said, we have to start thinking rethinking who we are as clinicians and the kinds of clinicians we're going to educate in the future. And he said, we have to start thinking of clinicians as systems thinking, thinkers, right? So systems thinkers, not people who are just uh, technicists, but able to interoperate with systems. And of course, now, as we face um, this growing field of um, generative AI, we see ourselves also trying to think about how we will work with that as a system. He was thinking very much in terms of clinical aspects, using all of these different tools in robotics, et cetera. Curriculum design, we know that a problem-based curriculum structure, such as those that have been um, well-established, for example, in Maastricht University, um, McMaster University, and of course, Hong Kong U, um, require enormous curriculum mapping to to gain that sense of integration across a spiral curriculum. Uh, but it's always been challenging to get, to scale that up and to keep it dynamic. And so uh, the right hand book, Interactional Research, that my colleague uh, from Japan and I, uh, Rintara Imafuku, and I did recently, one of the chapters is, is an attempt by Cindy Mello Silver and colleagues who were trying to have something that's kind of like a system like this, but you've got one master tutor online and multiple tutors in a room. So you get, you start scaling out with the notion of like a control box as you do in simulations. People have been trying to see how they can use technologies to help scale out at curriculum level. Of course, in a pedago as a pedagogic approach, I've been particularly working with colleagues in researching their practices and think thinking about a screen-based era. In that initial period when I was with dentistry, one colleague from um, North America said, well, we just say laptops are banned. You know, PBL is about dialogue. We can't have students racing each other to be Googling in class. We need to be talking through their prior knowledge in order to work them through the inquiry cycle. So already that was one challenge. Now we're in a different challenge uh, with the generative AI. So still, I believe the inquiry model can hold us there. 
back in um, 2016, we won this award for what we were what was being called by the QS Wharton Group, presence learning. So the idea of being present, all of us during COVID were saying, how can we be present for our students? How can we be present for our staff when we're actually physically separated? So at that point, pre-pandemic, when they were talking about presence learning, in our presentation, we were talking about how, how do we help students navigate this ubiquitous aspect, access, right? Ubiquitous access. Now, of course, generative AI is going to be a new form of ubiquitous access beyond our simple Google searching and so forth. So they were already thinking, we were thinking about how we manage navigation um, of the information flows that are coming into a room uh, as you've got a group grappling with a PBL case. We also were thinking about the kinds of meaning making, semiotic demands and opportunities of new type, text types. So the image up here is one of my colleagues from orthodontics had worked with a private company and had 3D models. Moving with an interactive whiteboard, students were starting to do treatment planning. I was just in the hospital recently and that was now normal practice. But these things are all innovations that teachers are bringing into the classroom. I talked before about dialogic approaches and I still stay very firmly with the work by Rupert Wegriff and the team at Cambridge. Um, and uh, I just think these are, these are essential to my thinking as we move forward. Education as induction into dialogue, okay? So this is, this is already where we see what's our role as educators, inducting students into dialogic processes. And then thinking about technologies as a tool for opening up and resourcing these dialogic spaces to enable people to think, learn and play together. I really like the joyful idea of playing together as well. Also, he argues that higher order thinking, and in particularly in our Gen AI moment, thinking that is distinctively human is responsive, creative and unpredictable thinking that originates in dialogues. So if we can still continue to work on these dialogic approaches, which are then infused and with and supported by technologies, that's the direction I've always been working in. To quickly recap a couple of key, key moments in my research in um, problem-based learning and technologies. Uh, this was a piece that we did back um, in 2016, where we were actually um, managed through a video-based ethnography to be recording lots of different practices across problem-based learning tutorials. And what we found as we built this ethnographic archive of videos we actually, going through it, found that we had this lovely contrastive moment. In 2008-09, we had the same PBL problem, same problem, same group composition, just at the emergence of laptops. So students actually had to get up and go and get laptops and start working on a problem that was internet collected, connected. We saw the facilitator in red having to get up, move around the group, try to see that everybody was on the same page. Okay, so there was no collective argumentation, no collective understanding. They split into dyads as they were looking at the stimulus um, of the problem case, etc. Not Google searching, just trying to work through a problem case. So that was a challenge. We actually then renovated our entire space. And we put interactive whiteboards in, we connected the scribe, the PBL scribe is an important role, the secretary for the group, connected the scribe to the large screen. And so it's the same problem, same design, same resource links, but here we have a much more collaborative controlled <laughs> environment where the facilitator is doing what a PBL facilitator usually does, sits back and says, okay, any more ideas here? And so they're just prompting the students to continue on rather than trying to help them navigate. So this was one, one study that really started me thinking about uh, problem spaces and how we work with technologies in problem spaces. 
we actually um, added a section. Uh, Cindy Mello Silva and Howard Barrows from uh, Medical Education had created a very famous paper on facilitation strategies. So then Cindy invited me to join her in this book chapter for the Height Wiley Handbook and to say, well, how do we then think about facilitation with these um, new affordances? And so this is where I started to develop some tips. We were asked, Stella was saying to me, are there some uh, tips that we can move forward in helping teachers to think about how they're working with these? So if you're face to face, you know, we haven't moved into thinking hybrid yet. If you're face to face, here are some of the ways that you can be working with the technology and a large screen. I'm not going to go through them all in detail. I have shared the PowerPoint, but it's just a signal to some ways that we were working face to face with technologies. Then we started thinking about, let's really look in depth at what's happening when, when a an experienced facilitator is working with a group of medical students over a, an extended problem cycle. Two weeks, three face-to-face -face meetings, video recordings of everything, and then collecting the artifacts that students generated both within and outside, and also having interviews with students. I won't go through the whole study, but as we stepped back from what we were making visible through the ethnography and the microanalysis of talk, we came up with this term dialogic intervisualizing. So how a PBL facilitator helps the students to search for, curate all sorts of different visuals that help prompt the dialogue in the room. So we're still focused on the dialogue in the room. We're focused on the learning outcome. And in this, in this small thread of one case, the outcome was for them to generate an image. And they could only generate the image with the salient knowledge that they had been researching relevant to the case. So we talk about how this process of dialogic individualizing is navigated in the moment and over time through this accessing and curating of student, student found information. So we talk about the inquiry cycle as a set of textual, a web of textual processes sitting within a larger discourse. We recognize the centrality and dynamism of these new text types. So in that one instance, we had students accessing and sharing YouTube videos, images, drawing on a screen, uh, saying, okay, let's check which image of a heart is going to be the best one for this case doing a Google search, throwing it up onto the large screen, deciding which image was going to help support them, putting that image into a shared Google document. These are all regular practices that we do now, but the dynamic of, of curating, discussing, and making these decisions and tying them all to solving or working towards understanding the dimensions of the PBL problem, that was key to it all. So you're building this discourse ties between the visual and the multimodal text and actions of the learners. Central to this is student agency. The students have agency and autonomy in navigating the flows. You're giving them that responsibility, but it's in much more open and fluid, but still guided by the facilitator. And one thing we found in, a, in an um, adjunct survey we did was students in the medical faculty starting to say, I really don't want my tutorial to just be a, a race for who can Google it the best or who can find the PubMed answer the best. So they also were, were sensing this tension between just turning it into a low order um, search processing to something that was much deeper and sustainable for their own learning. Um, and so in all of this, the situating, sorry, the facilitator expertise was central in guiding that process of textual development. And so that was what we did as we came up with thinking about dialogic individualizing. As I said, um, we've been, uh, have a long history at Hong Kong U in uh, problem-based learning. Scaling up's always been a challenge. And one issue that came up in terms of trying to think really scaled up was how do you take some of the ideas of case-based negotiation but build it into something incredibly big? So this is where we have 
this process called team-based learning um, in supporting interprofessional education. Now, working with my fabulous colleagues across the Faculty of Medicine and several other faculties, medicine was the lead in this one, we had 13 programs from across Hong Kong with students all meeting together on a Saturday morning for a three hour session, randomized groupings, et cetera. And you'll see how large the room was filled with students. They had done a pre-reading, they did a pre-test, they did a group test, and then they went into a series of problems. While they were physically here, they had multiple online gates mapped to all the stages of interprofessional education, sorry, of team-based learning. So they were randomized and mixed up into professions so that they could start thinking from a nurse's perspective, a physiotherapist's perspective, um, a social worker's perspective, etc. So very interesting and it still continues. However, what I saw there as we'd gone through the whole design was how interesting it was to watch the groups start to morph and change and move uh, as they were as they were forming, storming <laughs> and performing in the old 60s notion. So thinking about the learning environment as a, as a socio-material assemblage, that was something that we started playing around with and thinking about the materiality. Okay, final word on inquiry. There has been a raging debate and my colleagues in that debate have had so many wonderful citations, <laughs> some of them unwanted because it was more about a critique of their work. But this was just published this May. Um, let's talk the evidence, um, the case for combining inquiry-based and direct instruction. There has always been a tension. Teachers in the room facilitating PBL want to teach. Students want them to teach, but they're holding back because they want the students to work through the troublesome parts of the problem themselves and build autonomy for students. So that's an interesting um, tension we've all lived with. And we've had some colleagues saying, throw it all away and direct instructions the best idea. So uh, the full paper is there just out of education uh, research review, but I think the highlights solve um, any debates we're going to have today. So if we think about the inquiry-based methods are generally effective for inquiring conceptual knowledge. And I think that's where I've been leading you through with this introduction. But we have to recognize learners must have appropriate prior knowledge to benefit. Now, this is where the challenge comes. What is appropriate prior knowledge? This is the constant debate you have. Is it the senior secondary curriculum? Is it the introductory first and second years of our curriculum? Where do we, where do we balance this? And it continues to be a debate that only can be resolved by the content experts in their own field. Um, they usually provide stu uh, learners with scaffolding and a lot of Cindy Mello's work has been on scaffolding. But contextual factors determine the success of an approach. And they do, especially if you're going for a fully integrated inquiry-based curriculum, it needs a lot of, of back-end, dare I use that term, back-end work in terms of um, curriculum design, professional development. I sat with dentistry through um, many sessions where they were inducting new facilitators. And we just got to the point where we had graduates of the PBL program coming back to then be PBL facilitators. And they were saying things like, wow, I never knew there was so much work behind it. I thought the teacher just turned up and, and let us do all the work. <laughs> the, so when they saw all the facilitator guides, the process of developing cases and reviewing cases, they really understand the, understood the complexity of the design. Okay, second part of the talk was to talk about spaces, presence and in interaction. And while we're still with this thread of inquiry, so here we are in COVID. We started um, this, I joined this collective writing project from um, this lovely, lovely journal, Post Digital Science and Education. We were asked to, uh, we had in the first one had 88 academics sharing their story of teaching in the age of COVID. So we had 88 contributions um, and mine was a little poem that burst for, I'm not, I'm, 
I don't um, say that I'm a great poet, but a little poem burst forth from me in a, in a frustrating moment. So I did actually publish a poem. That's something that will go down in history. However, um, we were asked to write a small piece and then to attach an image. So this is interesting because my small piece, first of all, was my office desk where I was Zooming from in Hong Kong with face masks, hand wipes, all that sort of thing. Um, and that was two months into COVID in 2020. Then it was when we were really in the stage of not even coming to campus. Um, then this was me 12 months later converting my daughter's bedroom into a study and being able to look out over gorgeous Aberdeen Harbour. I was very blessed with that view and I would often turn around and show that as my <laughs> and say, and look where I am when I was talking with folk. So that was very calming for me to be there. And then, of course, 2022, I said, waving, not drowning, year three, and uh, couldn't write a poem then. The second, second one, I could write a poem. Third one, I had no poetry left in me. And that's what I said. I said, all poetry has been drained from me. Here, here we are in year three. But this is what we generated by then, this space. We had just um, started to uh, get to the point where we could launch this space. So it was kind of interesting because in the writing project, we were all talking about how we were adapting to different spaces. And even looking at those three publications and the three images, you can see that shift over that period. So here we are, hybridity, teaching for hybrid futures, thinking about hybridity. Um, I do commend this book to you. It's, um, it's rel relatively newly out and very exciting. So one of the things is that we at Hong Kong U have um, an external advisor, um, EAB, and they talk about some big picture uh, that they get from universities. I did in my abstract talk about the future of work. Well, they actually have looked at universities and their workspaces, workspaces, not teaching spaces. So this is a microcosm of the greater world. So you're looking at 89% um, of staff will be working remotely in that one case study. 89% of university staff will be working remotely. So this whole shift um, in future workspaces is very fascinating. And we're still using platforms like this, which actually are still very much web conferencing rather than learning platforms. What about what, what schools, uh, sorry, what universities wanted to do? Of the surveyed universities, 82% plan to upgrade the tech in their rooms, monitors at tables, wireless sharing capabilities, supporting space outside the classroom in hallways, et cetera. Lectures, they wanted to change it to group table seating. We've seen lots of designs like that. Video audio integration, 360 seating around a podium. So we actually see some of the return to the Greek amphitheater ideas, but with the digital screen in the center, like we see at basketball matches. Hybrid enabled, ceiling mounted microphones. We've tried that in some spaces here. Upgrading cameras, we have a tracking camera here. Multiple monitor screens on walls. I'll talk about what we've done with our walls and of course, green rooms. Before I go to there, there's also at the same time been a conceptual shift. So I think some of this writing that's coming out from our philosophical colleagues is really interesting. So Gawley says it would be nonsensical or at least unusual for this phenomenon of video calls to take place in a situation of embodied co-presence because essentially it's defined by absence, all right? So we, we're thinking about absent friends. <laughs> so I have a small group in person with me now, but the majority of people I'm talking to are absent friends. Post-digital education, that, that journal uh, did a lovely special issue on post-digital um, learning spaces in higher ed. So yes, we've seen more about digital platforms, um, but we also need to see that all of this reconfiguration of space is part of a post-digital trajectory that precedes, but will also transcend the inaccessibility of the physical classroom. And I love this second one. When students and teachers gather, they are present in multiple spaces, as we are now, where the digital, material, biological and social are intrinsically connected and co-determining. Connected, 
and co-determining. So I love the fact that our space is also influencing how we are interacting. Um, Tim Fawns, we just had him as a, a guest speaker last week. He um, has written two pieces on this. Basically, the post-digital perspective is disrupting this notion of binaries of in-person, online, virtual, real. And we start really thinking about situationally and contextually blending. And we're not disembodied from, but always entangled with the material. So this entanglement is something that I was really pursuing. Uh, Maggie Seven Baden contributed to um, some of that earlier work on PBL, and she started raising this this um, notion of liminality, and it was quite intriguing back then. And uh, she's really been building on it with um, with uh, Ball. So she's saying this period is marked by you know, uncertainty, liminality, and mystery that can feel threatening at worst and transformative at best. So we have to remember our students and our staff are threatened, but also we have potential for transformation. So to equip them, um, we need to engage with these um, liquid learning spaces. So here we are in a liquid learning space. So our planning process, we were actually very lucky to be handed uh, funds by um, Hong Kong Central University Grants Committee, who said, uh, please, while we were all struggling with the online, they said, please imagine the return to campus and develop new spaces and actually gave us money. So that was a challenge because we had to deliver a HK SAR showpiece learning space for a new blended future that we weren't even sure was going to look like. We had this old space that already looked pretty exciting. Um, it already had collaboration desks, it had screens linked to it, et cetera. But we really found that we're, there were so many limitations to the fixed furniture, environmental factors, you know, give people headaches. It was certainly not conducive to dual mode. So I already mentioned some of our imperatives to change the expanding campus, expanding practices of our staff. This is our professional development space. And also these concepts of post-digital modes and pedagogies and how we're going to capture that. We went for three operating principles because holding three things in my head works. So we wanted flat, we wanted flexible and we wanted interactive. So the architects were kind of like, no, no, but we have to have plugs in the floors. I said, no. This space is not going to anchor anybody anywhere. We have to be able to move to whatever the teacher imagines they want from the space. Uh, so we were really shopping around, literally, and looking at what other campuses were doing around the world. Luckily, we're in U Universitas 21, and we're looking, um, we created a working group within that group and had lots more conversations. Uh, you can see the bottom right image is from KU Leuven, and their experimental space, which was pre-pandemic, was, I think, the most exciting at engaging the online and the in-person. However, just like that desk design, fundamentally, it put everybody at the periphery, okay, whether it's at the group work or in the classroom. And so we also thought about these new workspaces that our graduates are working in. Can we create a workspace like that for our staff, our faculty? to be experiencing the kind of workspaces that are going out there in the corporate world. And so what's really proliferating are these co-working spaces. Um, lots, of, lots of green, lots of openness, lots of opportunities for collaboration. So that was also in our minds. And then we were thinking about these large screen affordances. We already had that experience with interactive whiteboards. Did we want to just pop up a lot of different plasma screens? What could we do differently? So this was a mock-up way we did as we were working through. And I have to tell you, one of the most important things in the co-design idea was to have the architects, have the building estates offices in the old space with us doing a Zoom call, multiple hybrid. And every time something went wrong, I stopped and said, and that's why it's not working. We need to address this. And that's why it's not, et cetera. So having them there experience the pedagogy you're trying to envision, envision, envision will also be part of that co-design process. So we also want to say, how do we 
interact this person with these people and the Zoom people. So I have, I'm talking to you from um, our tracking camera. So we have an infrared tracking camera. We have another camera over here. I can also just come up and interact with a group and with you at a table. And I'm part of this group here. Okay, so each table has 360 cameras and you can see that from your feed. So the table affordances, this really is where we got stuck actually, because the tables, I was looking at some of those ones that uh, they use in architecture, et cetera, that have the screen embedded inside so people can interact. But the Zoom person, of course, the view is terrible. We did not want to just stick a screen at the end of a table, right? We wanted to have this fluidity, crossing of these boundaries um, and entangling. And so uh, our concept was actually put uh, published in the EDUCORS Horizon Report in the in the US in 22. And the key thing that we that they talked we talked about was this idea of moving the Zoom person from the periphery to the center. So if you change to a gallery view, you'll be able to see that at the table we have the 360 camera view, so that actually. Catherine and William are both visible. Hey guys, Catherine and William are both visible in that panorama shot and we can choose which one of them it's um, orienting to. At the moment, it's on Catherine. So this is our final design. We tore everything apart, very aware of um, sustainability. We wanted it to be a warmer space. We wanted to use sustainable timbers. Uh, the audio, as many of you know, in the old rooms that we had was not helpful. And so we had lots of background um, audio suppressants, et cetera. So this is the, sp the whole space. The green wall behind you was critical to me. That is not plastic, that is live. All right, so we don't have external light. And so we were really cut off from the outside world. So how did we entangle <laughs> the living world with our very um, sterile environment? And so we have built in um, this wall and a big, big uh, credit to um, Tris Key who's done that. So I'll just show you one thing because time is tight. Uh, how, do we, how do we link this? large screen affordance of a wraparound canvas with projectors. Notice we did not go for LEDs. So this was um, a, a Professor Cecilia Chan's idea. I was thinking LEDs and she went to this um, notion of a projector, projector onto just a white canvas. This is just a white wall and it works brilliantly. So if we've got an example here, I set um, the two tables a task. I just said to them, imagine you're in breakout groups, you're working on a, um, on a uh, redesign annotation and uh, you're going to be sharing that. So we have two groups who are sharing. Yep, the two groups. And what's great, the big problem with, with Zoom is that if you've got breakout groups, working on some nice little collaborative documents, you're jumping from room to room to room. What we can do here is that the teacher can actually put every document being worked on at a different console up on the screen at the same time. And so you can see groups at work. So I can see um, one group working on the screen. All right, that's an interesting thing. Another group's thinking about projectors. So I can immediately have a look at their work in progress. I can also then move to a group and say, oh, Tris, this is really interesting. Could you share with us what's going on here? And yes. we can share screen. So Tris can share screen with us. Thank you, Professor Bridges. I wish to present some of the design for the green wall for the Hong Kong UCETL Learning Lab. And as you can see on the screen right now, most of the species that we have selected are from local Hong Kong species. Terrific, thanks very much. I know I'm hitting time. So here we are um, with very, back to share screen. Yep, always a little bit of coordination. So that gives you an idea of how we can work with the Zoom room. I'm not forwarding now. Alex, I'm not clicking. Yeah, there we go. So we've got a patent for our for our module, which was uh, very exciting. And 
We think we can do lots of things depending on what the teacher plans and they can do the synchronous hybrid. What was very interesting was that in our survey amongst our U22, uh, Universitas 21 group, one colleague said exactly what we know is the biggest issue. You can build these things, but it's institutional support, staff support and pedagogical challenges that are more interesting. We have tried it out. We're thinking about this notion of orchestration and capturing how someone actually deals with all of this information that's streaming in, in a room. And so we practice, put me on Zoom, looking into the room, talking to the group, co-designing with a teacher who had a large first year class of uh, our uh, common core. And what we saw was that actually there's this thing going on called orchestration load, that they have to attend to multiple activities and orient to multiple things in the room. So how is that enacted? Three facets of, of orchestration load is situation evaluation, goal formation and action taking. So our video recordings are able, uh, allowed us to show two aspects of what is in the orchestration literature from the learning sciences. So in the interviews and the observations, we saw these moments where this teacher, so multiple students working on multiple documents in multiple breakout groups, and the teacher's standing there back to the physical group, looking at the, at the screen. And then we can trace which group he chooses to go to. And actually we've got the recordings, the conversations. It's all very preliminary because we've only just finished teaching this piece. But also what was interesting was his choices, his situation evaluation, scoping the teams and which one he goes to in terms of a social orientation to orchestration. I went over to that group because I saw the online person wasn't uh, engaged and I wanted to work with them. So takeaways in these spaces, yes, co-designing, you have to stay with your vision. One colleague said to me, stay with the vision, Susan. It's very hard when you're trying to work across so many disciplines. Co-designing pedagogies, a design-based approach helps that, bringing your ethnographic eyes. Of course, in an inquiry-based um, approach in hybrid, clarifying and creating new group roles is very important. What are the ground rules for interactions? I recommend in our space that it's the online person who shares the group work. So they come into the space and we, and we keep entangling. Um, and be conscious of the Zoom room as another presence and these possibilities of both cognitive orchestration and social orchestration. That's the old Hermelo Silver paper back from 2006. And I think all of these um, strategies we use in inquiry are critical. 